Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And with me today is our guest, Professor Julian Lindley French, the chairman of uh, Alpen Group. Hello, Julian. Hello, Jacek. Lovely to be back with you again. And uh, uh, hello from a very hot and humid Netherlands. It's all my pleasure. Uh, as you, as our audience knows well, uh, uh, my guest today is, uh, is, is is a really prominent strategic thinker uh, and uh, in the West, uh, to put it broadly, uh, and uh, the questions that I'm going to ask today will pertain to the strategic picture that is upon us. The last time we, we talked, it was very well prior to the war that broke out in Ukraine, very well prior to almost open confrontation between US and China around this Nancy, Nancy Pelosi visit, uh, et cetera. And prior to energy crisis, food crisis, uh, you know, European crisis or political crisis in Europe, uh, and so on and so forth, before the Kiev offensive, before the stopping Russians in Kiev, before Donbass, you name it. So <laughs> the world has changed. So how would you, you know, how, how, would, how would you start our conversation so that we could draw some picture where we are? Well, I've started by saying that I got it right. I remember talking about about this, uh, the likelihood of such crises uh, when we last spoke. Um, so I'm not particularly surprised. Uh, what disappoints me, Jacek, is the failure of our leaders, the leaders of the democratic free Europe, to heed the warnings that people like me have been giving for two decades about the lack of strategic foresight, the lack of forward planning, the lack of building resilience into our societies, the lack of defense investment, the lack of security investment, which helped create the opportunity for Putin to, to carry out this appalling adventure against the people of Ukraine. Um, of course, it's amazing, you know, politicians, the moment a crisis happens, it's not their fault. Uh, but make no mistake, this is a failure of the European political class, from London uh, to Warsaw and beyond, uh, to listen to warnings, to heed the dangers of over-reliance on autocracies, whether it's for energy or Chinese supply chains. And that, in a sense, the crisis is entirely self-engineered through, through that lack of foresight, through that lack of planning. Uh, and uh, I... I, I I'm even thinking of writing a book uh, called The Guilty Men and Women um, who helped create this crisis. Could make no mistake, uh, our leaders are culpable in this disaster. Culpable meaning guilty, yes? Guilty, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, but speaking about the future, so what is your forecast? What do you think? Where will we be in a year, year's time? Well, in terms of Ukraine, I think we'll be in what I call a frozen war fleet. Um, Ukrainians have done amazingly with the support they've got, some of it good, some of it not so good, from, from European states and the, in the United States and Canada. Uh, but they're not strong enough to defeat the Russians in the field, decisively. The Russians are incompetent and brutal and all the things that the Russians are. Um, but they're there. Uh, as Russia tends to be. So I fear that unless we, in the West, particularly in Europe, commit ourselves to rearming the Ukrainians over the winter pause, there will be a winter pause because of the weather, the mud uh, in, in uh, eastern Ukraine. Come the spring, the Russians will try again. Uh, and and they will continue this this grinding warfare. Um, certainly Ukraine is not strong enough in my mind with great regret to seize the lands back which were lost post February 24th let alone Crimea uh, this is uh, and I fear what will happen uh, not next year but in time will be a quiet de facto recognition of Russia's gains by certain European countries and then over time, a kind of de jure uh, recognition of Russia's illegal gains. And that's what I fear. And the only thing that can stop that, the only thing that can force the Russians to negotiate seriously 
um, over the future of Ukraine, to cede back the land that they've taken illegally, and to pay reparations to the Ukrainian people, is if Western Europe, in particular, grows a backbone and and collectively forces the Russians to the negotiating table. But I don't see that backbone. I don't see that backbone amongst Western European leaders. So this is a Western European problem. I don't see publics when faced with soaring energy costs, uh, soaring food prices, um, threats to their uh, uh, communication systems, being particularly robust or resilient enough to want to maintain that kind of fight. Uh, it's, it saddens me greatly, but to paraphrase uh, Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain, for many in Western Europe, Ukraine is a large country far away about which they know and care little, particularly Eastern Ukraine. Whilst our friends and fellow Europeans in Central and Eastern Europe fully understand the reality and the threat and the danger of what is going on in Ukraine. Um, from a historical, from a personal perspective. I'm afraid many in Western Europe do not. And the Americans are not the problem of, of, of Europe or European security and defence. The Central and Eastern Europeans are not the problem. The problem is squarely in Western Europe. A uh, failure of leadership, particularly uh, amongst the British, the French and the Germans, who seem to want to spend more time scoring points off each other over Brexit than confronting the geopolitical realities that Europeans can only confront together uh, in the coming decades, given the nature of change in the world. Yeah, tell me, tell us more about how you see this change, this this change in the world uh, and the nature of it, so that we understand what is the superstructure that is creating this tension, because that's yes. what I understood from your words. Great, great question, Jessica. What are we fighting for? What we're fighting for is a rules-based international order. That's what the European Union is meant to be about. That's the whole history of Europe, post-World War II, Cold War, post-Cold War, has been to establish an international rules-based order, not just in Europe, but with democratic partners the world over, all over the world. Now, what we're being challenged with right now is a classical, cynical worldview of China and its surrogate pygmy Russia. To go back to a rail politic, dog eat dog, uh, um, power speaks world, in which, to, to, to paraphrase Thucydides or Thucydides, as people know him, the powerful do what they want, and the weak do what they're told. Now, that's, that's what's at stake in Ukraine. That is the, 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 the principle that we are fighting for in Ukraine. Do we want to go back to that world, the world that gave us the Nazis, the world that gave us the First World War, in which the insane ambitions of one or two men can lead to the deaths of millions, because that is what rail policy leads to. I'm concerned that what we're witnessing is a form of appeasement. And that appeasement must be stopped. The autocracies only understand strength. And it is vital that we Europeans rediscover collectively that strength isn't simply treaties. There's no point turning up to a gunfight with lawyers, as the EU seems to want to do. You turn up to a gunfight with guns. Not uh, too many, but enough to deter your enemy, to deter the likes of Putin and Xi. And it's that that's at stake in Ukraine, because if Putin prevails, he'll pause because he has to. He'll learn the lessons because he has to. The Chinese will watch. But he'll be back. He'll be back in the future if he's allowed to uh, destabilizing much of free Europe, including Western Europe. So we have to be clear in our minds what the threat is. 
And for too long, we've been strategically illiterate on a strategic vocation, pretending the world is all about globalization and supply chains and wealth and prosperity that never again could war happen in Europe. Well, there you have it. And people like me who've been warning of this for decades, who were told how wrong we were, I take no satisfaction from being correct. I do find it frustrating that some of the people who have told me how wrong I was are the very people who are now saying that they knew all along there was a threat that this could happen. It is time collectively we Europeans woke up and smelt the strategic coffee because it's going to be a tough, strong, hard coffee that we're going to have to drink in the coming years. And only together can we possibly confront it. I, of course, I, I've got uh, you know tons of questions uh, pertaining to this particular things that you have just raised, including the one: Do you really, do you really think it will take years? I share this this view. But before I jump into this question, let me give you the the, the growing feeling that we here in Central Eastern Europe are having in the context of this war, and uh, I would ask you for your comment. To what I have just said, uh, our audience is mixed, it's from the West, it's from the East, you know, so it might be an interesting uh, point of view from that perspective. Uh, here in Poland, we, you know, majority of us think that the war in Ukraine is uh, a major, you know, major turning point in the history of, of the world. And not because we are so anti-Russian or something, but because this is the um, this conflict and reaction to this war showed difference in perceptions and understanding between Western Europeans and Central and Eastern Europeans. We call the intermarium countries as to what Russia should be in relation to Europe. And this is. Julian, this is the most fundamental difference between us and Germans and between French and Germans. If we do not agree to what Russia is, there will not be a European Union. There is nothing more important for Poles than answer to this question. And as you see from the decisions that our government has made in the recent weeks, we don't care what you are saying in that respect, because this is our security threat. This is the number one of Polish Poland's grand strategy of the last 500 years that Russia must be out of the European balancing system. If it's in, we're doomed. If it's out, we prosper. And intermarium countries share this view. The problem is that we are increasingly think that for many continental powers, it's not the case. They need Russia for some reasons. And that undermines trust. That was the foundation of the West to which we sort of were walking to NATO and to, to you. This is, so this is a, the most fundamental crisis of trust. And if Germans don't quickly come to their senses, it will, un it will be unrecoverable. And I, 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 you know, I'm very pro-Atlantist and I sound grim, but this is what is happening daily. And this is what the Ukrainians thinking. And as you know, Poland has delivered everything it could to Ukraine. So we are functionally on their side. 500 tanks, you know, numbers of howitzers, ammo, fuel, food, money. And still we are watching the, you know, the, the Germans that want to wait out this conflict and make sure that the, the, in winter their industry is working on proper yields. So it was, it's not the, the West we wanted it to be, you know what I mean. So we, we are very pessimistic. We think that we are just entering the, the, the period similar to Napoleonic era with many clashes, with many blockades, trade wars and stuff all across Eurasia. And we must get ready for it. And we do not see European Union or Europe getting ready for that. So how would you comment all my grim words? I'm afraid I agree with you, Jacek. Uh, I think Poland uh, and other countries in Central and Eastern Europe have the clearer strategic appreciation of Europe's situation, uh, not just because of history, but because you live there. Um, the German position, as it has been since World War II, 
has been a mercantilist position. Do the minimum they can for defence because they're deeply concerned about having strong armed forces inside Germany for obvious reasons. They still use that. They still believe in that. Um, and they don't pull their weight. Uh, they see international relations as essentially trade. Uh, and that still is dominant in the Berlin culture. The French claim to have a special relationship with Russia. Uh, that I think the humiliation of President Macron has proved uh, not to be the case. Uh, the Russians only see themselves as bizarrely as being equals of the Americans, which they're not, of course. I don't blame Macron for trying, but I think he was trying for domestic reasons, not really to, to solve the, the, the war, to find peace. Uh, and his suggestion that, that Russia must not be humiliated. Well, Russia is in danger of humiliating itself, but how many people will have to die before before that is that is realized? We have a crisis in Western Europe. The bottom line is that the closer one moves to the Russian border, the clearer the understanding of what it takes to deter Russia. But regrettably, the smaller the power that's available to do it, with due respect to Poland, it spends 25% of the defence budget of the UK. The further you move away from the Russian border, the greater the power that could be brought to bear against Russia, to deter Russia, but the less the willingness to do it. That, that is the essential paradox of Europe in the 21st century facing an autocracy. I agree with you, this is not anti-Russian. And I agree with you that this Russia can no way be part of the European security family because the price it demands to be part of that family yeah. is effectively a veto over our security and defense. It, exactly. I, I call it a sharehold, majority shareholding uh, you know, package. I mean, it, 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 even back to the NATO Russia Founding Act in May 1997, implicit in some of the comments made by the Russian leadership then was this idea that Russia would have a de facto veto over NATO. Um, that, that, that somehow there was a uh, Russia was tricked over enlargement it was not tricked over enlargement the whole point of the Cold War or, or the end of the Cold War was that nations would have the right to choose their own alliances and their own strategic destiny that's called freedom and we rightly upheld that now uh, Russia without unless Russia is a functioning democracy over time that's willing to play by the rule book that democracies play by. Russia, regrettably, cannot be part of any pan-European security architecture worthy of the name. The only way that this Russia, or the only message this Russia understands, is that of strength, that of will, that of determination. And when I hear President Putin talking about Greater Russia, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, uh, talking about history as though somehow it's Russia's right to have control over the lands it claims. It strikes me that we're going back to the medieval period. We could all do that. Look at the, the ancient Polish Empire. Look at the British Empire. Look at the French Empire. Those days are over. And it's simply simply vital that we deter President Putin from these insane ambitions, which he seems now to have. Um, ambitions which, frankly, if they continue, will eventually lead to war with NATO. There's no other way to describe it. Um, I think what the, the most optimistic view you can put on Putin's grand strategy is that what he seeks is our recognition of a, his sphere of influence inside Europe. His sphere of influence includes Ukraine. He would contest the Baltic states with us forever, eternally. But paradoxically, he would probably accept that Finland and Sweden are part of the Western sphere of influence because of the way they've been leaning the nature of their societies for many decades. If we recognize what he wants, which is implicit in some of the comments 
I hear particularly from French and German leaders who simply want a quick end to this war, and a frozen war flip, as I've called it, then we are also implicitly accepting the principle that rail politic and spheres of influence are again relevant in Europe. How many millions have died in Europe in the last 120 years over balances of power, spheres of influence, and rail politic? We had meant to put an end to all this. How many Poles have suffered because of this big power policy? Millions. We cannot afford to go back to this. Julian, but plus Poles will never accept this deal. No, of course not. Even with the promise that Poland is not included in the Russian sphere of influence, because we will not believe in it. It will be only a correlation of power, of Russian power, where its zone of influence ends. Let me remind our audience that Mr. Wafrov, in December 2021, prior to the war, demanded the zone of influence up to the Oder River and withdrawal of NATO forces and establishments from Poland, which in the end would, it, that it would end up with the Russian having a say in Polish affairs, probably with Germans. You know, and this is a nightmare. Poles recalled history in December 2021. And that's why we, you know, launched this major uh, military modernization program. We are not waiting for others to join. You know, we just are doing it. And uh, no, no more Molotov Ribbentrop packs with their yeah, clause. Exactly. And uh, we simply will not believe that this would not happen. So, um, and Poland went to war over Ukraine many times with Russia. Uh, I'm telling you that if the Russians didn't have nuclear weapons today, I don't know what would be on the ground in Ukraine uh, in that respect. So this is this is the scale of vital strategic interest for Poland. Ukraine and Belarus are much more important for Poland than Portugal and Spain, with all due respect, okay, and even other peripheral countries of European Union. Uh, in terms of our security and, uh, you know, freedom of movement, the strategic flows, and so on and so forth, and of course, security threat. Uh, and there is no joke about it. We have had 19 wars with Russia over that. So uh, things have changed in Warsaw, uh, starting with uh, February, you know, launching the war. Uh, my question would be, uh, Julian, how just, um, so how to make it happen that the, you know, the European became consolidated again and confront the Russians. So the call that you find uh, increasingly important, uh, how to bridge those gaps, how to make this happen, given, of course, you know, the breaking social contract, gas prices, uh, fuel, everything that is completely you know, contradictory, internally contradictory to uh, to galvanize such support for, you know, anti-Russian stance or confronting Russia. How would you do it? Well, I, I would go back to one word, leadership. Mm -hmm. But before I expand on that, Jacek, I mean, I live in a Dutch village that was liberated by General Masek and the, and the Polish division in 1944. Poland has earned its freedom. It is for too long been subject to the machinations of other great powers. And Poland has earned, and should be, to my mind, Poland should be the conscience of all freedom-loving Europeans. Because what Poland went through, particularly between 1939 and 1989, is an inspiration for those of us who believe in freedom. But too few Europeans understand the story of Poland's struggle. And that is part of the problem. When I say leadership, and this will sound difficult for some Poles, that leadership must necessarily come from Britain, France, and Germany. And let me explain why. Britain, France, and Germany are 65% together plus of all defense investment in Europe. The British alone are over 25%. They are over 80% of all defense, research, and technology in Europe. Unless these three powers, and they are powers still, they still have economies that are in the top six or seven in the world, they still have leading militaries, unless these three can agree on a strategy of confronting Russia, 
of telling their publics that there's going to be pain to confront Russia, but it's necessary, then I'm afraid we're going to go on with this ridiculous charade post-Brexit, where it seems at times more important for Berlin, Paris and London to be fighting each other over some bizarre aspect of free movement or trade or Northern Ireland protocols or whatever, than actually actively confronting the great geopolitical challenge of the European age, which you rightly describe. Now, this is particularly important because the Americans can no longer be relied upon to always be in Europe in strength. The rise of China, the challenge to ta Taiwan, which we saw during the Pelosi visit, means that the enforced center of gravity of American grand strategy in the 21st century will be the Indo-Pacific. And frankly, NATO won't survive unless the major Europeans, and I include Poland and, and Italy and Spain and others in that, with the British, the French and the Germans, step up together to make NATO work and help the Americans maintain the contract to Europeans so that if they're busy in the Indo-Pacific, we Europeans can act as high-end first responders to a Russian-generated emergency. Now, that can only come initially from Britain, France, and Germany having a strategic compact, agreeing that they're going to put aside their difficulties over Brexit and take a bigger picture view and work collectively to make the alliance function in a way that deterrence is again credible. I've never known relations between London and Paris so bad as they are now. I've never known the anger in London so great at the efforts by Berlin to use the European Commission to damage Britain. Uh, this is a strategic sideshow, given the threats that we all face. And we need to get over it and move on. I didn't agree with Brexit, but the people voted. It's called democracy. Hey ho, get over it. Let's make it work. Uh, uh, because that is the reality of democracy. Uh, so we now accept the judgment of the British people and we move on. We make it work. But frankly, in Paris, Berlin and London right now, I see no real will to do that. And maybe it is so, Julian, that those, you know, the, 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 the strategic thinkers in Paris and industrial, industrial behemoths in Germany preferred, you know, the uh, continental consolidation with cheap gas from Russia, potential markets, potential, you know, murder of uh, heavy industry in Russia with, with the German and French capital, buffer zone from China, you know, this, this Vladivostok to Lisbon concept that consolidated the continent, great, gave great markets, secured cheap energy, yeah, and also created buffer zone from China. Maybe that was the grand vision of some on the continent. Of course, with a crash zone in Central and Eastern Europe to, you know, as a flyover country uh, to, to tramp on, on our, you know, voice in, in, in that matter. And that's why we always anchor with the Anglosphere to support our ambitions not to be part of this continental project. Like Mackinder, you know, remember, yeah. used, to, used to claim. Yeah, because Mackinder. this is how we... Because this is how we view the situation, honestly speaking, in very grim terms. Well, that exactly was the vision. And it was a pious vision in the hope that uh, uh, um, Rondel de Handel, that, that, that Russia would change because of the nature of the trading relationship. But any historian, and I'm a historian, would very quickly dismiss and dismantle such nonsense. All that those who believed in this kind of Ostpolitik were achieving was an over-reliance on a very unstable, very aggressive autocratic power who would use any vulnerability that they could exploit to the kind of strategic ends which are now apparent in Ukraine. That's why, in many ways, Western Europeans are complicit in this. Um, I'm happy to say my own country, UK, is not part of that, but more by luck than design. Um, the, the, the energy that, that Britain takes from Russia 
is very small. But then I do wonder, is London willing to give up the amount of Russian money in the city of London, for example? A true test of, of Britain's resolve in, in confronting the regime in, in Moscow. Um, is the, uh, as it were, expulsion of Roman Abramovich from Chelsea Football Club uh, an indicator of, of, of British determination? The, the Johnson government has been strong on this. But at the same time, there is no Johnson government. In fact, there is no government in Britain at, at the moment. Uh, we're stuck in this seemingly interminable uh, Conservative Party election campaign. So every major European power, Britain, France and Germany, every government in those powers is either unstable, Schultz in Germany, Macron in France, or doesn't exist, the current UK government. And that, frankly, in the midst of a crisis, is uh, is not just absurd, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, that's very sobering what you're saying. Especially, especially come this winter and come this autumn, that is come upon October, us. Come November, come November in particular, when when it gets cold, uh, then we are going to see the consequences of a failed policy over 20 years. And I, you know, it's not just continental Europeans who are to blame for this. In 2017, the British government uh, did not push uh, one of Britain's leading energy companies to maintain a gas storage site under the North Sea, an enormous gas storage site that would have made Britain far more resilient to the kind of energy shocks we're now facing. Um, and it's precisely that lack of foresight, that willingness to take risk, the inability to invest in redundancy, which has made much of Europe so vulnerable to these kind of shocks. And that is why, to my mind, many political leaders of the last 20 years are guilty of helping to create the conditions where someone like Putin could think could get away with this kind of murderous adventurism. Yeah. Of course, we mentioned China many times in our conversation already. And uh, you, you rightly stated that the United States' attention, strategic attention, power projection capabilities will be more and more oriented towards the Indo the Indo-Pacific. So how would you add China China's factor to our geopolitical situation in Europe. I understand the number point is that we must be ready that the United States must might be pivoting towards Asia more than it would like to because of the challenges, but still they will be forced to. That's number one. And we need to cover this gap somehow internally. And the second thing I understand is that there might be a real hot war in the Western Pacific, right, Julian? There could be. I hope there's not. Uh, but you look at the Chinese military modernization program, uh, and there clearly is a growing threat of clash with the United States. Not the, the design of that program, the nature of the force that the Chinese are building, is clearly designed ultimately to confront the Americans. Now, the flashpoint is Taiwan. Uh, China, President Xi has made it very clear that by 2049 and the centennial of the founding of the, founding of the Communist Party of China, that China, Taiwan will be reunified with mainland China. The Taiwanese are determined to resist because of what they've seen in Hong Kong, where the 1997 basic law agreement with the British has been trashed by the regime in Beijing. The way the Chinese see um, Europe is basically how to use the Russians as useful idiots to further complicate the life of Americans, to weaken the Americans by forcing the Americans to stretch their forces thinly worldwide to offset European weakness, so that they can have the best chance in a major emergency of securing Taiwan. Now, you know, people talk about a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Well, frankly, it would make D-Day look like a relatively minor operation. It's 140 kilometers or so wide, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, it would take a massive maritime amphibious uh, air force 
to land securely on Taiwanese defended beaches, which the tiny Taiwanese would fight very strongly for. Um, the Chinese have no experience of blue water maritime amphibious operations, unlike the Americans or the British, who've had decades, if not centuries of experience of these kind of operations. So the weakness of China is that for all the, the ships they're building, all the aircraft they're building, the weapon systems they're building, actually launching such an operation as D-Day would be difficult enough. To operation to launch an operation that would be four times as big as D-Day would probably be impossible. Remember, it took the Allies four attempts to get the D-Day thing right. They landed in Italy, Anzio, Salerno, um, uh, in North Africa, and each time they were learning how to do these kind of operations, which are very complicated uh, combined joint operations. So the Chinese are going to find it very difficult to take Taiwan. But the wider picture is that China ultimately will see itself as the dominant power in, in the Indo-Pacific. And at some point, that will require contest with the United States. I hope that there will be a peaceful solution. China is not Russia. Uh, in spite of Xi's uh, preeminence in Beijing, the Chinese leadership is far more collective than, than Putin in Moscow. Um, the Chinese also understand that they are a developing country. Their primary aim is to maintain the growth of the economy so that they can uplift the people of China. Because the domestic contract the Chinese Communist Party has with the people of China post the Tiananmen Square massacre back in 1989 was that we will make you wealthier, you the Chinese people, but you must not question the authority of the Communist Party. So the key dynamic of change in power in China is maintaining the economic growth to maintain the development of the Chinese people so that the Communist Party stays in power. That is the essential power challenge inside the People's Republic. If that growth fails, then the Chinese part, the Communist Party becomes vulnerable to internal dissent. And then is the danger of foreign adventurism and the clash with the Americans. And the, the greatest paradox of all, Yasek, and I've just written a major piece for the National Defense University in Washington about this, is that it's not Russia that makes China rich and powerful. It's the West that makes China rich and powerful. And the way China has behaved through the pandemic has damaged our relationships, our links with China, very deeply indeed. And it is now China that's facing the threat of the globalization that made it rich ending as supply chains are reshored back to the democratic world and therefore losing that economic growth we give them and therefore creating the very conditions whereby the Communist Party over time could lose power. So the paradox for me in China's policy is that it should be building relations with the West, not trying to destroy them because that's the source of its power. And it's interesting that for all the rhetoric Many Chinese state-owned enterprises have been very careful not to breach the sanctions against Russia that we've set. And they've not sent large amounts of military equipment to Russia. So there clearly is an ambivalence in that Russian-Chinese strategic partnership, which, frankly, we need to exploit ruthlessly to make sure that it doesn't, over time, become something more permanent. The Chinese despise the Russians. Um, they're enjoying being the dominant partner. Uh, uh, remembering history when Russia tried to impose its own dominance uh, on, on the Chinese. So it's, it's not a clear cut relationship as some would have it, the, the Russo-Chinese relationship. And I do think that, that we need to exploit that vulnerability. Yes, uh, I agree. W what I fear uh, in terms of uh, behavior towards China is that the United... I, I don't believe that the United States at the moment has a, a really crystal clear strategic vision how to operationally 
address this um, issue. For example, I understand from what you're saying that Americans are too thin to face two front war in Eurasia. So they would like to make it in a sequence or at least avoid any war at all. But for example, I wonder whether, you know, this, you know, pushing now China to the limits by visiting Taiwan is not making Xi Jinping think that he is, you know, the rat in the hole, you know, next to the hole, next to the wall. And sooner or later, the Americans will go after the, the Chinese. So we'd better, you know, make the, the Russians survive by, you know, giving them spare parts, land lease of the kind, you know. it's mm. The Chinese are the main manufacturer of the world today, not the United States. So they can, you know, help them with sanctions. So far, it is true that they have avoided this crisis because they wanted this, the globalized system to operate further for their own benefit. But what happens? What happens if this calculus has changed in Beijing because of the pressure? And then we have the Eurasian continent consolidated under the autocratic power against the Rimland countries, including Poland as at the forefront, yeah. actually, and American power coming from far away. That that would be completely game changer if the Chinese decide. Remember what happened when I, I often talk to you know people when actually United States joined the Second World War. I think it was not after Pearl Harbor. I think it was after this, you know, the, the, the seizure, seizure of Paris by Germans. And Roosevelt made the decision to help the British, you know, survive the war. So functionally, that was the moment, in my opinion. So I'm wondering whether the Chinese have made this decision to help the Russians or they, they haven't yet. And do you agree with my opinion that this will be a you know turning point in this sort of, and how to address it strategically and operationally not to push the Chinese to, to, to that corner or maybe do it later but what is your take on it yeah I mean, first of all I'd say that I think the turning point for the Americans was August um, 1941 with the Atlantic Charter but the key day when the Americans decided to the that they really were going to support the British by the Air Force, including uh, three Polish squadrons. Uh, but then they realized that the, the Germans couldn't defeat the British. And therefore there was a, a you know, a possibility of, 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 of helping Britain to survive and in time um, overcome, the, uh, help you know, defeat Nazi Germany. The Americans in 1940-41 were very weak indeed. And, and that encouraged the Japanese, indeed, in 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 in, in the Indo-Pacific. The point about, in a sense, yes, you answered your own question, because if Russia is a basket case economically, socially, it's it's weak. Mm -hmm. China finds it very hard to build partnerships beyond warrior diplomacy, debt diplomacy. China is a very long way from the kind of globalized generated power that would enable it to realize your Mackinder-esque vision without huge risk and likely defeat against the likes of Japan, possibly even India, um, uh, America, the West, all the democracies, because it simply isn't powerful enough. And, and we exaggerate Chinese power at time, times. We, in the same way we exaggerate our weakness. But the solution is staring us in the face for that not to be even thought as a possibility, which is Europe to get its act together, which is Europe, which has something like, I can't give you the actual figures, but five of the top 10 economies in the world to start organizing their power appropriately and collectively to make it so impossible for the likes of Putin to prevail, that the kind of strategy that you lay out is simply, that the risk is simply too great to bother with, that it's simply much more useful to accommodate the West will all be strong for China. And it will, if you look at the facts on paper, Economy size, trade size, China is unless we are willfully weak. 
And it's this sense of the need for Europeans to relearn the art of power that is vital to convincing the autocracies that life would be far better for them if they work with us than if they work against us. And that's what I mean by the complicity, the complicity, complicity of European powers in creating the conditions where Putin could make this disastrous decision to invade Ukraine. Uh, we now have to wake up and recognize that we have the power. We have the means, we have the skills, we have the, the technologies, we have the experience to generate the kind of defensive power that really would make it impossible for any coalition of autocracies to threaten us. But it takes leadership and it takes will and it takes foresight. And it's precisely leadership, will and foresight that has been missing from Europe for the last 20, 30 years. We've seen, we've been almost obsessed with building the Euro world, the Eurosphere. And so the rest of the world doesn't exist. Well, it does exist. And it's now reminding Europeans that we are part of that world, not some separate Euro world in which all that matters is what EU bureaucrats decide in Brussels. Speaking of power, Julian, I know that you are working on your new book about the evolution of warfare, at least as I understood, from the angle of how the Americans are perceiving the evolution of the battlefield. Would you share a, a bit of this uh, you know, book, especially given the, um, the lessons we learned in Ukraine? And I'm particularly very interested because I'm writing my own book in Polish about it. And uh, Poland is about to, to, to undergo a major modernization program. So we, we will simply feel a new army. And I would be very much interested in what, what the future, what you know, warfare would, is going to look like. Well, thank you. I mean, the book is called Future War and Defense of Europe. It came out with Oxford last year. The German edition came out with Cosmos this year. And I was, I'm pleased to say it was a bestseller in Germany uh, for, for a time, which was interesting that it would be the bestseller. Um, essentially, warfare is going to operate across three domains, hybrid, cyber, and hyperwar. Hybrid war will be designed to destabilize democratic societies, misinformation, disinformation, um, the use of the internet, uh, all sorts of ways of messaging, strategic communications to build distrust between democratic leaders and their peoples. Uh, cyber war is what it says. Cyber war would be offensive and defensive use of cyber technologies to destroy the capacity of critical infrastructures to function. Uh, be they civilian or military. And hyperwar is the interesting area, uh, which is what the Future War and Defense Conference, which I'm leading, as you know, in Wilton Park in October, will, will address for much of it, which is where artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, 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 hypersonic technologies, quantum computing, um, uh, nanotechnologies, all come together in the battle space to create a situation where warfare becomes so fast, both the offensive and the defensive, that it's difficult to know where the human fits into the command chain. That's beyond 2050, but that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. I fear what I call uh, the digital decapitation of, of NATO, a kind of dreadnought moment. Back in 1906, the British launched a new battleship called HMS Dreadnought. She was the first turbine-driven, fully armoured, all-big-gun warship. She was faster, stronger, and more powerful than any ship on the planet. At a stroke, the British had made every other navy in the world obsolete. Trouble was, it also made their own navy obsolete, which meant they had to embark on a huge building programme to rebuild the Royal Navy in, in time for World War I, which successfully they did. What worries me is that we're going to get a kind of dreadnought moment where artificial intelligence in particular, swarms of technology, of drones, machine learning, quantum computing, and we're just on the verge of what quantum computing can do, will make machines 
intelligent in the sense they can probe defenses. They can communicate with each other over where the weaknesses are. They can exploit those weaknesses autonomously from human command chains. Now, we in democracies have ethics. It's the essence of liberal democracy. And we will always want to ensure that there's a human hand over those technologies, controlling those technologies. But what are the autocracies? History suggests they don't have ethics. What if a Hitler had had artificially intelligent weapon systems that could destroy Britain, for example, in 1944-45 as a wonder weapon? He would almost certainly have used it, as he would have used nuclear weapons. So these are the the this is the where future war is going. And um, what I'm trying to do with colleagues like General Ben Hodges, General John Allen, and others in the Arthur group is to get policymakers in all our capitals, London, Paris, Warsaw, Berlin, Washington, wherever, to look outside of the forced planning box. And don't just say, we're going to have a bigger, better army in 2030 than the one we had in 2010. Because having a bigger, better army in a, this effectively an analog force in a digital environment will be like having a bow and arrow in a cruise missile fight. What matters are the choices we make now about the European future force. And that European future force must be digital. It must be able to operate across air, sea, land, cyber, information, and knowledge. It must have space architectures that are robust. It must be a have a have a force, a fighting force that is interoperable interoperable with the American future force. Technically, technically interoperable, because technology drives strategy. But these choices have to be made now, because the technologies that are involved will require 10, 15, 20 years to develop. So it's vital, Yasek, that we have the vision now of what that future force is going to look like. Because if we get that decision right, we can deter the autocracies. When they understand that with our resources, our technologies, that we've got it, we understand the nature of future war, we will not be reacting to them. We'll be forcing them to react to us. And that is the greatest thing one can do to ensure credible deterrence in the 21st century. Force your autocratic adversary to react to your choice. Do not, as democracy, be forced to react to their choices. And now is the time that we need to make such judgments. Mm -hmm. I, I fully agree. There is a great debate in Poland between the old school and the new school. Old school, you know, being moving mass, maneuvering mass, tanks, you know, mechanized infantry. And the new school that is uh, more about ODA loop, uh, swift swiftness of it, competence, and of course long range fires, uh, and sensors. A lot of sensors and making a fusion of sensors and effectors as creating a deep battle. And uh, we think that this might offset the, the numbers that the enemy can put to the field. Because if you have the information dominance, then the, the numbers still matter, but not that much as of the last 200 years then, yeah. uh, since the uh, French Revolution, where the masses were the most important factor on the, bat on the battlefield. So, um, the, 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 right, we are in the midst of a major debate how to push the Polish uh, mental reform, uh, whether we want to have this force of the future or we want to more... Yeah. I may interject, and apologies for doing so. Uh, in both. But look at the Ukraine war. There are many levels in the Ukraine war. But one of them is that every time the Russians have tried to mass force or even concentrate command, they've been destroyed. They've been destroyed by long range fires. Yeah. The, the most vulnerable time for any force is prior to its attack when it's concentrating mass. Now, what we're going to have to achieve in the battlefield is a kind of a distributed mass where. Mass is spread out across a very large area 
but it comes together very quickly in a whole range of forms. Because mm. what you're generating is effects on the enemy. Yeah. And so, effects on the enemy uh, will be across the entire spectrum uh, of, of, mm. of force. Be it from information force, cyber coercion, to kinetic attack. Yeah. All going, much of that's going to be automated and digital. So we have the capacity to think this through and develop the order of battle of the future. But I, I just hope, and I, I, you know, Poland's so important to the deterrence, the land deterrence in particular of Europe. And by the way, so is Germany to the land deterrence of Europe. But the choices you make now, which will give a signal to so many other allies, the choices you make in this review will signal to allies the direction of travel for many of them and the choices they make. As you strike that balance between metal, metallic mass and digital effect, because that's going to be the transitional force towards 40, which we will need to maintain credible deterrence. It'll also need to include things like improved military mobility, more secure military mobility, uh, even things like legal military mobility, so we can cross borders very rapidly in a pre-war emergency. You know, the devil is in the detail of military modernization. It's not just about big formations and fancy bits of kit and equipment. It's about the detail of how you get your force, the right force, in the right place at the right time to prevent a disaster or, if needs be, defeat those trying to create a disaster. That's it. And what do we do to achieve that? That is our challenge and certainly the one that the book discusses and, and to which people like you and I are working towards at the conference in October. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julian. That was uh, really uh, interesting in, in terms of the evolution of the warfare and very futuristic it might sound, but still, you know, setting the technology that are right now emerging. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I promise uh, the audience to, to have a chance to talk to you again about this, maybe only about this particular subject. If you don't mind, I... I of course not. Always a pleasure, Jasek. Sure. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, our guest today was Professor Julian Linde French, uh, uh, the chairman of the Alpen Group. Uh, we discuss uh, Russia, China, US, Europe, the future of the battlefield, everything that is uh, in debate now and uh, looking forward to speaking to you soon again. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, Jesse. Great pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.